a reverse Nordic. Why wouldn't you just do a normal Nordic? So this is clearly not for the hamstrings. Does that mean it's for the quads? Is it for the abs? Is it for your low back? I don't really know. I know Bobby loves this thing. You give it to, to everybody. But first of all, uh, we're going to figure out exactly what this is. But first of all, welcome to the Anatomy of Therapy. I'm Dr. John Cebulski here with Bobby Riley. Today we're talking reverse Nordic. And I mean, Bobby is in the middle of all the Nordics in Iceland. So I figure he'd be the, the kind of the master on this one. But yeah, what's the deal with this reverse Nordic? Yeah, well, I mean, there is a Nordic hamstring curl, right? Where sure. if he's in the same position, but somebody sits on his feet and he controls his descent forward, right? That's a that classic, way. you know, mm -hmm. hamstring exercise that's quite difficult right. that we yeah. all tried to do. Uh, so we have the reverse Nordic curl. Uh, you can get rid of the hamstring because the hamstrings are kind of on holiday on this one. Right. But so you're kind of falling backwards instead of forward. And I think until recently with, you know, social media and the internet, I never really saw this exercise too often, to be honest, even though it's simple and seemingly simple and doesn't right. involve any equipment. I didn't really, really see, you know, I didn't really see it around. I didn't see it in the gyms too often. I didn't see it being given right. as a, as therapy, but I think that's changing a little bit. And, uh, I think that's a good thing. I mean, I like this one. Yeah a lot it's self-limiting in many ways um it's kind of it, it, you definitely can screw it up but with yeah. a few with a few pointers people usually can understand what what's bad and what's good on this right um there's easy modifications for people with like knee pain or you know old old uh osgood slaughter points or bad ankles yeah. it's really easy modify to modify and it's self-limiting in the in the extent of you know how far you go back is is limited you know by your own biology at the moment so it's self-limiting in that manner so i think it's a very very applicable exercise for many people for sure i wanted to stop you on self-limiting what do you i mean i understand what self-limiting means but like in a what, what is what, what's the benefit of a self-limiting exercise what why is you know I feel like you and I know what self-limiting means, but what do you, what do you mean by self? Like they just can't go to a place that would hurt themselves. Is that what you're trying to? Yeah. I mean, it's not, a, it's not precisely self-limiting, but it, it is in a way where it, it usually becomes quite obvious when you can't control this anymore. Okay. So you'll either cheat dramatically, like bending your hips or arching your low back. Mm -hmm. um, you'll start to sit down on your heels instead of bending at the knees. Gotcha. Uh, usually these things, maybe in the first few exercises or, or rounds that the patient is not really, or the client is not very aware that they're cheating, but shortly right. with a few cues, they can kind of figure it out. Yeah. Uh, and especially if okay. they, you know, took a personal video like this from the side, they can, they can see. So yeah. it's self-limiting in the sense that you, you know, there's a certain point where you, like he stops, you know, yeah, he's pretty soon. And now. if he goes any farther, he'll fall on his head or he'll right. hurt his back or something like sure. that. So usually you can kind of tell. And if you go slow enough, you can tell when you're about to cheat. And then that's the perfect point to pause and reverse and come back up. Gotcha. Yeah. So let me ask what you're trying to feel like predominant or like when you're telling this to your patients, like what do you want them to feel on this exercise or this activity? Like what's kind of the like your first goal? What's entry level step one? You got to do this. You got to feel this. Well, the interesting thing I, I would say is, you know, if they don't feel anything and they do it perfectly, yeah. they might not need it, uh, okay. to be honest, because they probably should feel something, yeah. whether it's because it's, you know, if you're trying to do this for quad strength, I mean, there's probably mm -hmm. other things we can do, uh, sure. just pure strength. But if you're trying to think of, you know, extensibility and strength or pliability uh, and strength or functional uh, mm -hmm. lengthening, stuff like that. Well, yeah, but just pure quad strength, there's many better things out there. Uh, yeah. So, I mean, if they can just go back and touch their shoulder blades to the floor and then come back up beautifully, well, I mean, just, uh, okay, Dude. let's just find this. This is not your problem. There's so, not many of those people though, right? I mean, no, like I mean that's got to be a hell of a small, small percentage, right? I mean, that's why that you give this to a lot of people. I mean, yeah, some some people, many people can't come anywhere near butt to heels, not even close. Yeah, sure. So, I mean, I have a football uh, soccer player right now who yeah. who is I don't know ten inches from his 
from the butt like yeah and it's just burning down his thighs and you know if you if you put him prone and bend his heel to his butt like he can his thighs burning and he feels pressure in his back you know like and he's and he's in the clinic for what do you think uh low back pain gotcha so i mean you can give you know i wrote down what do i give this for i give it for knee pain low back pain hip pain tight calves thoracic pain yeah i don't maybe it'll even help help somebody's headaches but i mean (laughs) there's just so many things i give this for right uh but I mean, one of the most common is low back pain that I give this okay. for. Not not yeah. necessarily knee pain or th- tight thighs, you know? <laughs> right. Sure. No, because it does. So like, let's talk about how this could possibly get us to help us with low back pain. Yeah, sure. Like what, how, I don't really see exactly how this could give us, was it decompress our back? I mean, I, I guess he's feeling a lot of, you're going to use your abs. You're going to feel your quads on this, but yeah. What are you, what is he feeling? Well, just imagine if he could, you know, if he stopped there, you know, he was only 10 degrees back and he felt like he either had to bend his hips or arch his back. In other words, that that's either in an extremely short anterior chain or a forward pelvis or some combination of both. In other words, in other words, this, a lot of people with a a hyperlordosis or a kind of a, you know, you could say thickened paraspinals, deep lumbar curve, you know, yeah. they, they actually don't do very well at this exercise. It's not always the case, but if you're, if you're so tight in the anterior chain, you're basically limiting the ability of your pelvis to, to counter nutate and, and for those iliums to go back. And, and that is going to often lead to lumbar compression. Okay. Does that, does that make sense? No, I, I follow. I follow. So, so, you know, by lengthening the anterior chain, I mean, sometimes this has to be done in conjunction with a hamstring program, for example, because okay. you have on the other side, you have the hamstrings that will concentrically uh, counter nutate. And then sure. you have the, you know, the quads need to eccentrically lengthen to allow that and concentric right. activity on the hamstring. So sometimes this in isolation won't be enough, but I mean, you know, often I'll give a couch stretch or a wall stretch as a precursor to this and then use yeah. this for some some more lengthening plus control and strength. Um, but the simple answer is the, the that anterior chain, those quads, those big muscles can, you know, be in a right. shortened position and they attach below the knee through the through the tendon. So right. as you as you bend back, if you if you can't lengthen that then the pressure goes into the low back. As you can see in, in Frank's video, he does very good, but at the last five degrees or so, you can kind of see his back arch. And you'll okay, see people yeah. you'll see people do that, you know, with 15 degrees of, uh, of uh, bending over, and you'll already see that happening. Yeah, this is where I kind of get in with my patients. I mean, it's a simple thing. It is not high level clinician stuff, but it's like there are prime movers and fine movers in the body. This is old school, like Gray Cook. Your quads are prime movers. Your low back should be secondary. Same thing with your abs. So these should be more stable while these guys should be doing the bulk kind of of the moving. And so at some point you're kind of saying that, at least in that last five, I mean, he's got a pretty good pinch in his low back there. It could be normal. But in that last little bit, rather than being able to eccentrically control and let his quads go further back, he's getting the rest of that motion with his back is, is what I'm hearing basically. And so being that you know how the the self-limiting aspect that you were talking about whether it's five degrees in or five degrees from the bottom you're going to kind of hopefully and this goes back to a couple podcasts this is like a recurring theme we've got here but you're going to be able to sense yourself where you are limited in and then hopefully your body as it becomes aware of that starts to kind of transform you get to make little adjustments here like I always also thought of this as a good like quad and almost like hip flexor kind of um, I want to say disassociate is a good a kind of a good way to say it. Um, a lot of people do not just feel their quads in that mid belly at all, honestly. Um, so I do I do like this for knee pain. I do like this for decompressing. I just people talk about people who are quad dominant. Um, 
does this exercise help those who are quad dominant or hurt those who are quad dominant? That's my question. Mm. Is it not even a factor? No, no, I think it actually can. There's, there's times where this exercise actually irritates people's knees quite a bit. Sure. Um, you have to be a little careful with this one, actually. Um, yeah. Okay. If you have some pretty strong, maybe IT band issues or patellofemoral mm -hmm. pain syndrome, and you throw this at them, it can be so much compression in the knee because in the early stages, there's not a lot of, you know, gains as far as the strength, the extensibility of the anterior chain. So what right. you're getting is just a ton of shear and rubbing and yeah. friction and compression in the knee. So at right. first they can almost get a little irritated and maybe that run later that afternoon is even worse than normal. But, yeah. but as long as it doesn't continue to worsen, I, I tell them that's kind of normal. Just anticipate mm -hmm. this little setback, you sure. know, don't go too hard right away. And then, you know, you'll probably have to work through that phase and then You'll, you'll get into you know clear air but people who are super quad dominant for example uh, or who are really you know maybe quad dominant and hyperlordotic mm -hmm. uh that it could cause some issues because it's so much tension that they they they're just they're you know they just can't do it without feeling like their back gets all pumped up and and, and uncomfortable right. or their or their knee gets irritated you know uh, that's it. that's quite common actually so yeah and so now, I mean, the other thing I'm noticing, the pattern that is ar arising here is this uh, other extension um, strategies, I'll say. How do people extend? So like a lot of people, uh, how do, how do people, extending also kind of means moving forward, I guess, right? Creating torque, creating tension. So one of the, the big ways that people create torque and tension is in their low back. That is why we see so many low backs. If you're in this industry at all, you know that low backs are just a big, big, big deal. One of the ways people don't create extension tension is through the quads. Is that fair? So like this is, this is an extension activity dominantly, right? Mm -hmm. And what I would, another way I like to phrase this one is that we're bringing the quads into like an extension strategy. Mm -hmm. in, in other words, you're going to extend your low back needs to extend. Your head needs to go backwards at some point in your life over your center of gravity. If your center of gravity is up here, you need to move backwards at some point. When you do that, are you going to move with your back? Are you going to hyper extend a knee? I've seen a lot of like high school athlete girls with hyper extended knees and hyper uh, lordotic backs. Never could feel their quads. But I give this to them a couple times and get them to feel somewhere in their mid kind of quad belly. And it just wakes that little part of their system up basically. We're bringing some extra resources into extension. It's just another stupid way i like to explain if that makes any sense whatsoever no that, that does make sense i would say the vernacular can be a little confusing because i'd also say Fair. that these people have uh, don't have a maybe a physical awareness of their hamstrings often sure because you know they may have such tight quads all, all the time because they are quote quad dominant which actually right. can over be oversensitization to where they don't really feel them but then you can have the kind of reverse thing happening in the hamstrings where there's a lack of sensory awareness so you, you don't feel them period so a lot of times right. people who are very quad dump they got these big meaty thighs and vastus lateralis but then they're quite weak on a hamstring test and then they also can't feel like they're they're using their hamstring but they don't have like this sensory awareness you know you tell them can you feel your hamstrings and they say yeah as they touch it with their fingers and uh, right, right, right. and they say no no no, not with your fingers and then they say well no actually no I, I can't really tell that it's firing you know what i mean right and they're often weak so yeah i i see that that that's that's where you see if you have a weak hamstring and you have yeah. a quad dominant person you're gonna have a hyperlordotic pelvis low back situation because right. the puppet strings are just unbalanced there the anterior chains pulling forward the posterior chain is not able to keep that under control and right. you know i wrote down the other you know things that connect to this which is you know t-spine yeah. problems and 
okay di diaphragm position you know which you know people who know that you know what we're into know that that's such a big that's a big deal and with hyperlordosis how you have basically an inability to kind of get the diaphragm in the right position there's just right. there's a lot of connections to this issue so you know when i write down you know this would be a good exercise for tight calves that seems like a very weird thing to say sure because you're you know the person's pointing his feet right there that's actually shortening the calf how could this possibly help but right but for example if you can never get out of hyperlordosis then you're really never going to stop plantar flexing your foot into the ground and therefore yeah. your calves are always just going to be active so sure so you can stretch your calf this is a scenario where the person says i stretch my calves all the time but they're always yeah. tight well right. then neurologically somewhere in the body is that tone is necessary based on the position that the person's in and this right. is one of those positions that can be doing that so gotcha. you know they can't I, expand their t-spine it's so tight well because they can never get their center of mass to go backwards so right. that they can unlock their pelvis and they can never counter nutate because the, the, the damn paraspinals are so tight and the quads will never let go. Right. Uh, yeah. I mean, we can just go on and on on that topic, but for sure. Let, let, I love first it. and we, foremost, we, everyone give this for people with knee pain. Okay. <laughs> just hundred percent, hundred percent. And, and there's a difference between the knee pain that people talk about when they, when they feel a strain, when they go backwards versus like the knee pain of the knees contact in the grounds, like, like our friend over here is using this pad on the ground only because he's on AstroTurf, right? Just to give his knees some cushion, right? So like you should feel some tension mid belly and stuff, unless there's some serious orthopedic. And hopefully if you're a doctor, you've kind of cleared some of that stuff out with the knee. So you know that it's safe. Um, but yeah, shifting back like crazy. So the next kind of part of this, I want to get into, you mentioned kind of timeline. So like generally for a person, let's just say average run of the mill Nordic person, right? Because that's who gets these. Mm -hmm. um, how, how many sets, how many reps are you kind of giving them? Or is it dependent on, yeah, what's the, what's the load look like when you give this generally? I would say it's medium to high volume in the sense of maybe two to three sets of 10 to 15. Yeah. You see it's, and is there a study that says that for these reverse Nordics? No, I mean, it's, it's yeah. based on my anecdotal experience. I just think, and I've done these a lot myself. I just want enough sure. input uh, for it to do something. And again, I usually yeah. stretch before this, sure. uh, especially for the very tight people. I usually, you know, do like a wall stretch first and then okay. have them work on these. So, um, but yeah, I mean, I just think two sets of three is not enough yeah. volume and five sets of 30, nobody will do. And right. I mean, they're harder than they look. So if you're not For familiar sure. with these, definitely try them. And that goes back to self-limiting too, because, you know, the harder you work at controlling this perfectly and your speed and everything's under control and your, and your right. depth, they, it's actually quite difficult. So it's very difficult. It's hard not to cheat with these. You'll, you'll very quickly run into your kind of own limitations with this very quickly and kind of be able to discover them, which is also always better. I used to, we, we haven't talked about this in a while, but I used to use this as a test hmm. uh, for patients, you know, talking about sneaking and work that we, we did last time. Like I'll do this with a test with people. And oftentimes um, we'll just have them kind of go back. I'll tell them to go back five or 10 degrees, like not much and then pause. And uh, I give them a little pad under their knees uh, and their feet. So it's kind of even on my, usually on my treatment table and ask them after they, after they go about five or 10 degrees back, uh, do they feel more of your left knee pushing down or your right knee pushing down? And it's very common that they'll feel one side or the other dominant, right? So this is a bilateral exercise, but I've never met anybody who has done this prime like the first time and been like yeah it's perfectly 50 50 e either side it's usually quite obvious mm -hmm. and so one of the quick things i'll do this is just a, a fun little clinical pearl which will help build some awareness because you're asking them is there more left or right and they're going to tell you oh now i got to think about it left right whatever it is to then push down the other knee so that you make the weight 50 50 as they go back and so it starts to get immediately tougher when they try to level it out 
And they're also trying to keep that 50 50 balance pushing down through their knees, keeping their hips forward as they go back. Mm -hmm. And I mean, most of my patients, if they could get 45 degrees back, it's impressive. Most of them can go 20 degrees back and then come back and their quads are just absolutely on fire. Um, but after doing uh, like five of them, you, it depends. Like say if they go back five or 10 degrees, can't go very far, kind of deconditioned person and they can figure left or right kind of has and then balance it out. Um, very quickly, your hips will start to unlock. Like it's kind of crazy if you have them stand up and then like recheck a toe touch or recheck kind of extension. Um, very quickly, it can your the the human body can balance out. And I would say this is kind of on a scale of like a deconditioned person to a very conditioned person. Like if it's a really strong person, a couple reps isn't going to do anything. Mostly, a couple reps isn't going to do anything. And I'll even tell the person, look, you may feel a little bit better. This just means this is we're on the right track. This is you're not fixed right now. You know. It's a fun little party trick that I just kind of show them, look, I know what I'm doing. I'm going to show you your imbalances and this is something you need to work on. Um, but I really like that little kind of check your left versus right side because then it just makes them that much more aware of, on top of all the stuff you've been talking about. Yeah, maybe to piggyback off that asymmetry thing, you can, you can also, sometimes I'll put... Sometimes you can see it on the floor. Fine. You'll see the compensation where you start their feet in line with their knees, but then as they do two or three of them, their toes start to come together, like their feet yeah. start to touch. Uh -huh. uh, and you can really see this sometimes if you just put their ankles over a foam roller, which is okay. a really good way to do these with people who have bad ankles, by the way, because yeah. many times doing like this, this the, nobody wants to do this. This hurts a lot. Right. Yeah. Yeah. This is totally normal though. This, Th uh, this is natural. This, but if, you if put, you're doing this, the, you should be able to do it like this the first time, I would imagine, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, we like to, you know, in my clinic, I like to show this video to say this is what's possible. Uh, right. So you don't really have an excuse why you can't go 30 degrees backwards. Okay. Right. And he's holding perfect form pretty much the whole time. So yeah. somebody that doesn't have a strength limitation, doesn't have a flexibility limitation, and certainly doesn't have a core, uh, core control problem. No. Right. And, and people, other people have all of those together, but going back to the, um, when the feet start to touch, um, or you'll see one foot really come in. Okay. I mean, one of the words I wrote down for this and circled was like decentration of the hip. And hmm. so yeah. like, if I, let's say you started both feet neutral, be in line with the knee, but as you did a few reps, let's just say the left foot starts to to slide across the floor or across the foam roller. So yeah. it's basically touching the right foot. So you'll basically the left hip is trying to externally rotate. Right. Could, and that for, for one reason would be that, you know, the left vast, vastus lateralis is so tight that uh -huh. it's just way more comfortable to just abduct that femur a little bit mm. and externally rotate it to cheat that exercise. And Got if it. they have tight vastus lateralis, lateralis on both, uh -huh. Well, then their the both feet will kind of equally come together in the middle yeah. uh, to kind of cheat because by abducting a little bit, they can cheat those lateral quads. Right. And, and, and when you see that on one side, I often see that maybe it's the same side or maybe it's the opposite hip has okay. a bit of FAI type of symptoms because, mm. so what I mean is if, let's say you have a left vastus lateralis that's super tight and causing this kind of torque at the, at the yeah. pelvis, well, then, then you may have basically a decentered hip on one or both sides. And, right. and by a decentered hip, I just mean it's not, you know, it's not sitting in there perfectly. So you'll, you could have some impingement issues. Uh, so you're talking about your, the, the, when you're saying decentered hip, just real quickly, the femur on top of the pelvis. So like mm. the femoral head is a circle and it sits in the acetabulum and decentered would mean that it's not in the middle, that it's sitting out of out of alignment is kind of a, an old school chiropractic way to say it, but it's just not in a very advantageous position. That's what you mean when you say decentered. Yeah, I, yeah, exactly. I mean, when you have such tensions going through like around these bones, and as you put them in these positions, and it causes the bones to spin based on the amount of tight tension that's in the system. Well, yeah. when those bones spin, they uncenter and and then they can pinch necks on acetabulums 
easier right. or in different positions. So that's just a little side thing. I mean, you don't have to worry too much about the FAI correlation, but definitely right. this, you know, you can see this issue with, um, the, you know, the lateral quads and you can reinforce that by trying to, you know, keep their knees in or even put their feet outside their knees slightly. And they'll, right. you know, for the, for the IT band, for the runner's, runner's knee kind of people, you can, uh, you know, kind of internally rotate the femurs slightly and they're going to feel okay. their lateral quads a ton. And they might feel that yanking at the lateral knee almost to a painful degree, which right. is just reinforcement that they need it. Although you may have to regress them if it's too, too aggressive at first. Uh, okay. So this, maybe this is a good angle you were talking about. So in this position, he's going, I mean, that's that he's an in internal rotation, but you're talking about bringing the feet even closer in together or bringing the knees closer in together here. And the knees so like, closer together, like the knees closer so if you together. Bring, yeah. If you bring in the knees closer together, you're basically going to get the outside of these quads a bunch more basically. Yes. If of course this knee's coming in, this knee's coming in, then you're going to get these vastus laterali that are IT band provokers. Okay. Gotcha. Mm -hmm. Just want to make sure we're visually on the same page here. Yeah, and but you'll yeah, see I, yeah, people that have that, you know, IT band, Gertie's tubercle kind of knee pain. Yeah. You know, often that side will be kind of really, really lit up with these and they'll want to yeah, abduct that, that knee. So that knee will slide out on the okay. floor or the foot will slide inward toward the midline to try to cheat that, that Gosh, lateral thigh. Yeah. find this real quick so so you're saying okay so let's just say he's got uh that that there's your gertius tubercle outside of the it band pain he's going to want to move this knee further out that way if he's super tight in this vastus lateralis and it band basically so that he can kind of get around that and you're saying if you do have those people with that lateral knee pain to put their knees a little bit further in knees together to then just kind of load this appropriately. Yeah, if you can, yeah. or at if least it's yeah. or it's at least confirmation of what you think is the issue. And no, may maybe you have to do some release stuff or stretching for a couple of weeks. You yeah. know, if, if they just can't keep the knees, you know, inward at all. So yeah. but yeah, you're exactly right. Exactly right. It's so, unconscious that they will do this like you know wrong. Right. So. It, it's just a compensatory habit. They haven't like, they're not like trying to cheat your rehab program by like letting these knees go further out. It's just, it's just, there's that word in anatomy trains that's biotensegrity, right? This, right. this is just biotensegrity. It's the same exact reason why you have to arch your back if you go too far past okay. your limit, yeah. because the biotensegrity on the system is going to say, well, if you want to go any further, the only way is to arch your back because I'm done. This is the end of my capability. So when gotcha. that vastus lateralis hits its end range, the only other thing, if you want to keep going backwards is your knees are going to slide out on the floor or your right. feet are going to slide. There's just no other way to cheat it. Or you're going to bend your hips or something. Yeah. So, so this is back to the, this, this is the same thing. This is going back to what you were saying about how good this is as a self-limiting exercise. So these are more of the reasons that are self-limiting. You lose biotensegrity through the anterior leg, anterior thigh, hip, knee, and then your low back starts to take over. There's an echo in here, hopefully. But but yeah, so that, that's, that, that's that, a cheat. Yeah, I wrote down abdominal inhibition as well, because when you when your low back takes over and you can never shut it off, well, then your abdominals, is, as ripped as they may appear, uh, uh -huh. are, are somewhat inhibited when you sure and you have people with these you know hyper hy hypertrophic you know hypertrophied lumbar paraspinals because they just can right. never shut them off and they often complain of this you know whether it's low back or mid or tl junction like a pump almost like they just got out of the gym doing deadlifts but they feel like right. they're you know all day long yeah, he's got a he's got a massive TL there for sure. He's got a lot of mobility in his low back, but that make, but that makes sense. Say that's the same thing with the leg. You were talking with the legs going out as this as soon as that tensegrity it laterally with the vastus lateralis, that's where they're going to try to swing that knee out or that swing that foot in naturally, not cheating, just because that's they've met their self limiting their limit of tissue tensegrity, and that's again why. This is a repetitive thing. You're not going to do three of these and be fixed. You need to increase the length and uh, of the muscle repetitively so that you can get to that length and then go back. 
and do that enough such that that stretch stays because just the one time like quad stretch i mean this is you could go as simple to say that this is an active quad stretch like from here to here those quads that is you know if you reach your arm back and grab that that leg that's a quad stretch so this is a double active quad stretch reverse nordic just sounds so much better because god love the nords you know um man we've covered so much what what else are we missing with this thing so far doing lots of reps quads lumbar inhibition ab inhibition tl junction improvement knee pain knee pain y'all knee pain <laughs> um different types of quad tension hip rotation there's just a lot of good stuff going on here what what the last, how, how do you want to finish this off? Like, what's the one message that we need to remember with all of this? Uh, I would say, you know, just start using it um, yeah. and use it, you know, at first locally. Don't mm -hmm. worry about, you know, if it's, if it's something that you're, this seems the topic that or the conversation seems a little over your head, well, then just reduce it to uh, an active quad stretch, which is, that's how I would classify it. I wouldn't even think yeah. about a, a quad exercise. I would say an active quad stretch yeah. and just start to use it and start to use it. I mean, use it as a test and a tool like John said, and I use it as a test often as well. Use it as an exercise, uh, use it uh, prophylactically for, for knees. I mean, if the person's in good health, I mean, just give them two sets of 10 of these before they go for their run. I mean, just, yeah. Uh, or before you before you do your squat workout to just pry open the knee joint a little bit and prep everything uh, i mean you might sit into a squat deeper after you do these uh yeah. which would be very good so i mean just start using it and do it yourself so you can teach it well um because i don't know maybe for every 10 of these i see one looks beautiful this is one of them sure. so this everybody the should only. do these until you can do them on yoga blocks and flatten your back <laughs> i mean it's possible you can get there like it's and it's worth it it's a it's a great movement that has a lot of payback i think um but i think that's a great way to end it uh thanks frank madrano thanks yo kim <laughs> thanks tony uh thanks to all the guys who provided videos um like this, share this, smash that like button, tell a friend, give this to somebody who needs to do this. Find, find a friend who you know will probably suck at this and, and challenge them to do this. And if they don't understand it, tell them to come listen to this podcast and they can learn everything they need to know about it. Uh, but that's all for today, folks. Peace. Have a good day.